Our text for this, after, or this morning's sermon is to be found in Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. For the benefit of our brothers and sisters in Pilgrim, as a church family here in Providence, we have been engaged in a series dealing with the gospel of Mark. We've been working our way through the first nine chapters of Mark's gospel. and We've made two passes through these nine chapters. First of all, we began with Uh, a number of sermons that dealt with Jesus' relationship with his apostles as they're presented in these nine chapters. And then we've gone back to the beginning of Mark's gospel and we've made a second pass through these nine chapters and we've considered how Jesus faced demonic opposition over the course of his ministry. We've had two sermons now that have dealt with this demonic opposition and this is the third sermon in that series. So our text then is Mark 9, verses 14 through 29. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed. And they ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do something, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. This is the word of the Lord. May it stand firm and sure forevermore. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the text that we have before us this morning is one that is absolutely shot through with conflict and tension. First of all, this passage, it highlights the the conflict between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness that we've been speaking about during the course of this series. Jesus and his three mighty men have just been to the mountaintop, and there for a very brief moment, Jesus had, he pulled back the veil of his humanity, and he had had graced his apostles with a vision of his heavenly glory. And so doing them, in so doing, he'd given them a foretaste of what life in his kingdom would be like. But now, as Jesus and the disciples descend from the mountain, the inexpressible beauty of those moments, it gets slammed up against the horrifying reality of life in this broken and sinful world. Once again, the borders between these two kingdoms have pushed up against each other, and once again, conflict is the result. Mark then proceeds to illustrate the intensity, the degree of hostility between these two kingdoms 
And he does so by telling us of another conflict that's been raging during Jesus' absence. As he returns to the lowlands of Galilee, Jesus finds himself immediately drawn into a debate. And it's a debate that sprung up between his disciples on the one hand and the scribes on the other. And we're told that the event which has sparked this debate was the disciples' failure to free a young boy from demonic oppression. And brothers and sisters, we need to understand that that this is not an insignificant or a minor debate. Because while the disciples' inability to have cast out that demon, while their inability may have been the occasion for this dispute, the real issue at stake here isn't their authority, but Christ's. You see, at at that time, there was a well-known and a widely held belief, a belief that can be summed up by the adage, the message of a man is as the man himself. The message of a man is as the man himself. And that adage, that proverb, it helps us to appreciate the seriousness of what's happening here. You see, at the time, the underlying assumption about disciples was that all disciples operated on the basis of a delegated authority. And that means that the message they brought was understood to be their master's message. And it means that the power they wielded was perceived to be their master's power. And so, if a disciple was found to have delivered a false message, well, that would have implications for his master's reputation and credibility. And if a disciple proved powerless, the only conclusion that people would be able to draw was that their master was as weak and as ineffective as they were. This argument then, This argument that's been raging during Jesus' absence, this this argument that has erupted between the disciples and the scribes, it was an argument that represented nothing short of a direct assault on the integrity of Jesus' ministry. Because if his disciples had lacked the authority to cast the demon from that child, then surely Jesus claims that the kingdom has come, must also be called into question. And what we're seeing here is an attempt then, it is an attempt by Satan to put an end to Jesus' ministry by undermining his personal credibility. And Jesus' sudden arrival on the scene, it has the effect of transforming what had to that point been a a rather theoretical debate about the genuineness of his authority, it has the effect of transforming that theoretical debate into an intensely real test of his power. You can imagine the scene as Jesus finds himself surrounded by all of those peoples, the, the disciples, the scribes, the crowds. And all of the people who are gathered around him, they're wondering whether he will have the power necessary to heal this child. Now, as we're going to see shortly, it turns out that Jesus' arrival is going to, it's going to transform this debate in ways that no one there had imagined, because Jesus will soon make it clear That the real issue here is not the limits of his power, but the boundaries of our belief. At that moment, however, as Jesus reconnects with his disciples, he asks them what it is that they've been arguing about with the scribes. And before anyone else can answer, a, a man steps forth from the crowd And he confesses to being the cause of all this strife and upheaval. He informs Jesus that what had provoked this conflict in the first place was the disciples' inability to cast the evil spirit out of his son. And the father's description, 
His description of the boy's condition, it provides us with a sense of the suffering that this child had endured. The father tells Jesus that as a result of the the demon's influence, the boy had been rendered mute. His son had also experienced what we would associate today as being the, the symptoms of a grand mal seizure. And if you've ever had an occasion to witness such a seizure, then you know that these are terrifying things to behold. Now, the father's motivation here, however, it actually goes beyond the desire to simply alleviate his son's suffering. He is also desperate to preserve his son's life. And this was particularly important because as we know from Luke's account of these events, this boy was that man's only child. The dire nature of these circumstances then It extended beyond the boy's health to include the health and indeed the survival of that entire family unit. And if you recall what we have learned from our sermons on the book of Ruth, then you will remember that there was no greater source of anxiety for an Israelite family than the fear that their family line might come to an end. These were dire circumstances then for both the boy and his family. And having undoubtedly heard accounts about the about the mighty deeds that Jesus and his apostles have accomplished, this family has packed up and they've they've come seeking healing for their son and a future for their family. And things have not gone well. Because despite their best efforts, the disciples have been unable to provide this family with either healing or hope. Which for this family was more than just a little disappointing. And for us as readers, well, it's more than just a little bit surprising. Because we know from what we've read earlier in Mark's gospel that not only had Jesus commissioned the disciples to go out and to proclaim the gospel message that the kingdom had come, he had also empowered them to heal the sick and to cast out demons and to do so as a sign of the authority of the message that they had brought. And as such, we know from reading Mark's gospel that healing this boy and securing this family's future, it's something that shouldn't have been beyond the capacity of the disciples to accomplish. And confronted with these circumstances, confronted by the, the combination of this family's suffering, the disciples' failure, the vicious attack of the scribes, And the crowd's desperate desire to see more signs and wonders, Jesus responds with an outcry of exhaustion and exasperation. With a loud acclamation, he decried those gathered there as being a faithless generation. And he bemoans the continued need not just to be with them, but to bear with their weakness. The question that we then face now as God's people, as we, as we examine Mark's gospel, the question we face is what are we to make of this cry? How are we to understand this, this visceral exclamation of frustration on Jesus' part? Well, we need to see in his outcry what we must learn to see in all of Scripture. That is a testimony about who Jesus is and about what he has come to do. In that sense, beloved, the the first thing that we want to see in this cry is a wonderful confirmation of our Lord's humanity. We're reminded here as we read these words that Jesus was not some kind of superman. He wasn't some kind of superman who simply passed through this life without any real suffering or struggle. Far from it. No, in taking on our human flesh, it meant that Jesus experienced the weaknesses and he experienced the frailties of that flesh. 
And that means that he got tired. It means that he got frustrated. It means that sometimes his circumstances would push him to his emotional limits. Of course, we also know that even though he experienced the weaknesses of our flesh, Jesus never gave way to those weaknesses. No matter the circumstances he found himself in, he always remained perfectly obedient He always remained perfectly sinless. Nevertheless, this cry, it provides us with evidence of his truly human condition. Beyond that, however, this cry, it serves as a powerful testimony of his personal faith and trust in God. And that becomes clear when we consider the question of who exactly is being identified as a faithless generation. Now, most commentators in in seeking to understand this verse, they've concluded that Jesus is talking about the disciples here. After all, it's been their lack of faith that has kept them from casting out this demon. And so the suggestion is that Jesus' cry, it expresses a sense of his continued frustration with their weakness and their ignorance. Conversely, a minority of explainers have identified the scribes as the ones being targeted here. From this perspective, it's the continued hard-heartedness of the leaders of God's people that's the problem. It's their refusal to submit to the authority of his teaching. It's their refusal to acknowledge him as the long-awaited Messiah that results in conflict with the disciples and now with him. And the suggestion here is that once again, faced with these attacks, that Jesus has simply had enough. Now, I'd like to suggest, however, that Jesus' outcry here It's actually rather more comprehensive than generally gets acknowledged. And I'd like to suggest to you that in actuality, Jesus is referring to the entirety of those who are gathered around him that day. In that sense, Jesus' critique, it's it's actually leveled against the disciples, the scribes, and the crowd who were there as well. And I say that because when we look at the whole of this passage, we discover that there's a remarkable similarity between what is happening here in Mark 9 and the events that that Mark has already described for us in in Mark chapter 6. There in Mark 6, in in the passage that we read in preparation for this service, We're told that when Jesus was in Nazareth, he was prevented from, he was unable to do many mighty works there on account of the unbelief that he experienced in that city. Now, clearly, the limiting factor here hadn't been a deficiency in Jesus' power. Mark does tell us in that very same passage that Jesus had laid hands on and healed a few of those whom he'd encountered. And so we know that it isn't an issue of Jesus somehow lacking the necessary power to bring this about. There's no deficiency in who he is or in the authority that he wields. No, the barrier, the limiting factor, it had been the refusal to believe in him. And Mark tells us that the degree of resistance Jesus encountered there was so intense that he marvels at the degree of their unbelief. Well, we find a similarly staggering lack of belief being displayed here in our text. The disciples have failed to believe They have failed to trust completely in their Lord. The scribes have failed to acknowledge him as the Messiah. The crowd seeks only to be amazed by more signs and wonders. And this time, Jesus, he doesn't marvel at their unbelief. He cries out against it. And Again, beloved, we're we're being taught an important lesson here about who Jesus is. 
Because we need to understand that Jesus, his exhausted and his exasperated cry, it sprang from an awareness that once again he stood alone. We need to hear in his exclamation the cry of a righteous man who has found himself completely surrounded by sinners and faithless men. His cry reflects the reality that he knew himself to be the only authentic believer in a world of unbelievers. As he looked around at everyone who was gathered there that day, he knew, he knew that he was the only one who believed with a rock-solid confidence that God was working through him to rescue a people for himself. So the exhaustion of this cry, The exasperation of this cry, it's also evidence of the extraordinary suffering and the extraordinary isolation that Jesus endured during all the days of his earthly ministry. And knowing that, knowing that can serve as such a powerful comfort for us, beloved, especially during these times when we're being forced to endure a time of social distancing and isolation. As we struggle to cope with these strange and difficult days, we can be encouraged by the knowledge that the one whom we serve knows all that there is to know about isolation. Because as a perfectly righteous man, he experienced isolation every single day that he walked through the midst of a faithless generation. And as the son of God, he experienced isolation in a far greater way than anything we're capable of imagining when he was cut off from his father as he hung on the cross. And so in this cry, In this cry, we're reminded of his humanity. We're reminded of his righteousness. We're reminded of his suffering. But we are also comforted that we have a great high priest who serves as a perfect advocate for us in heaven precisely because he knows what it is like to experience the weakness and the frailty of the flesh that we bear too. In addition to all of these things, however, these events also highlight our Lord's compassion. Yes, he's isolated. Yes, he's exhausted and he's exasperated. Nevertheless, he remains absolutely committed to abiding by his Father's will. And his Father's will is that he should suffer on account of those whom he'd come to save. His Father's will is that Jesus would rescue the lost. And that is exactly what he proceeds to do. Jesus commands that the boy be brought to him. And as has been the case in the the previous examples that we've examined, the demons don't come easily into Jesus' presence. As the boy comes before him, the demon seizes control of him and send him into convulsions that leave him writhing on the ground before Christ. Now, while the encounter between Jesus and the demon here, while the encounter between Jesus and the forces of darkness is once again a violent one, I do wonder if you noticed the difference between what happens here and what has happened when Jesus has encountered demons in the past. There's something different about the way that this demon reacts to Jesus' presence. That difference is this. In both cases that we've examined thus far, both in Mark 1 and in Mark 5, when the demons are confronted by King Jesus, they have cried out his name and they have spoken the truth of his messianic identity. But not this time. This time there is violence, but there is also silence. 
In fact, we're told that one of the sufferings that's been inflicted on this boy is that the demon's presence has rendered him both deaf and mute. He doesn't speak. And we need to consider for a moment the significance of this change. Why doesn't this demon employ the same pattern as his predecessors? Why doesn't he seek to exert control over Jesus by, by speaking his name and the truth of his identity? Well, brothers and sisters, I think that the reason for this demon's silence has everything to do with the fact that the true significance of these events is not to be found in Jesus' confrontation with the demon, but in Jesus' confrontation with the boy's father. Jesus hasn't come to have a conversation with these evil spirits. He's, had, he's come to have a conversation with this man. And so the demons have been rendered silent so that conversation can unfold without interruption. And it's worth pausing here for a moment. It's worth pausing here for a moment and asking ourselves what kind of power is this? Who can exercise this degree of sovereignty and might? Think about it for a moment. Jesus' power over these evil spirits, it is so absolute that when conflict occurs between his kingdom and the kingdom of darkness, he's not only able to dispatch his foes with a word, but he's able to determine who shows up and how they behave when they do. Jesus has come to have a conversation with this man, and for that to happen, this demon needs to be quiet. And so there's silence as they come before him. Well, if that's the case, that Jesus has come to have a conversation with this man, what does Jesus want to talk to him about? Well, he wants to talk with him about the boundaries of his belief. And that becomes clear as these events unfold. Jesus asks the father what might admittedly at first glance seem like a rather curious and even callous question. He asks the father, how long has the boy been experiencing such affliction? And we might sort of pause and wonder to ourselves, well, what difference can that possibly make? Why would Jesus respond differently to this boy depending on the length of time that he had been suffering? What's the point of a question like this? Isn't it a rather odd and, and even cruel question to ask a father who's so desperate for healing and hope? Well, as with all that Jesus says and does, we soon discover that there is both great wisdom and enormous grace in his question. First of all, by asking this question, Jesus was giving the man an opportunity to speak freely about the grief that he endured. He is privileged with an opportunity to unburden his heart to his Lord. And again, beloved, that ought to serve as a comfort for us because we're reminded that then we too are free to speak to Jesus about our fears. We're free to come to him with our griefs and our, and our sorrows and our struggles and our burdens. We're free to tell him about all that has burdened us and weighed us down. We are free to cast those burdens on him. And the picture that this main this man paints as he begins to speak is certainly a grim one. Not only is this boy his only child, but he's endured these circumstances since his youth. And what's, what's worse is that not only has he experienced these grand mall-like seizures, but the evil spirit has actively been trying to kill him by means of those seizures. We're told that when the spirit seized control of him, it tried to cast him into the fire and it tried to cast him into the water as a means of ending his life. Brothers and sisters, you, you may recall if you think back several weeks now to the first sermon in the second part of this series, the very first time that we considered Jesus' encounter with 
a demonically possessed man in Mark 1, the title of that sermon was A Tale of Two Fathers. And in that sermon, we learned, we learned the hard truth that those who are in Christ are blessed to have God as their father, but those who reside within the kingdom of darkness, they are cursed to have Satan as their father. And here we see again, just as we saw when we examined the circumstances of the man named Legion, here we see again that Satan is an abusive father. The freedom he promises, the pleasures he holds out, the the control and the liberty that he offers his children, we've seen that those are nothing more than lies and illusions. Satan's only goal, his only goal is to erase the image of God in man, and he is prepared to pursue that goal by any means necessary, even if that means inflicting tremendous suffering on those who belong to him. Jesus' question, however, Jesus' question was meant to accomplish more than just giving this man an opportunity to unburden himself and to to express the sorrows that he carried. No, this question, it was designed to provoke this man to think about the hopelessness of his circumstances and then in turn to challenge his willingness to look to Jesus for rescue. The point is, is to highlight how everyone in this man's life has failed. No one had been able to help this boy. The father hadn't been able to help him. The doctors presumably had not been able to help him. The scribes, the rabbis, the teachers of the law, even Jesus' disciples have been able to do nothing to alleviate this boy's suffering. He suffered all the days of his life, and he looked likely to suffer all the remaining days of that life, which if the demon had his ways, wouldn't be very long at all. And the question becomes then, when all human help has failed, will this man believe that with Jesus there continues to be hope? We can see that he's on the threshold of believing when he, when he essentially says to Jesus, that's why we're here. We, we've tried everything. We've gone everyone. We've appealed to everyone. We've tracked down every solution and therapy we can find. And that's why we're here, because we're hoping that just maybe, just maybe you'll be able to help. And if you can If there is anything that you can do for my son, please have compassion on us. And Jesus' response here, Jesus' response is what links this whole narrative together. He says to the man, if I'm able, seriously, if I'm able, of course I am able. But my ability isn't the issue here. No, the the question isn't whether or not there are limits to my power. No, the question is whether or not there are boundaries to your belief. The real issue is whether you are prepared to radically and completely cast yourself on me and to express your absolute dependence on me for all things. Because as Jesus says in the very next breath, For those who believe, all things are possible. What's being demanded of this man then is nothing less than an unreserved giving over of his life to the care and the control of Jesus. He's being asked to declare that he has no doubts, that he has no reservations about Jesus' ability to save both him and his son. He's being asked to declare that he won't set his hope in anyone else or anything else than Jesus. He's being challenged to believe unto salvation. 
By the grace of God, we need to see how this man responds to that call to believe. He cries out to Jesus, I believe, help me in my unbelief. And in some ways, it's such a small, it's such a, such a pitiable cry. This is a mustard seed faith if there ever was one. Nevertheless, despite its weakness, it is a real and it is an authentic cry of faith. And we know this to be true because of the way in which Jesus responds to it. Seeing the crowd rushing upon them, Jesus turns to the boy and he commands the demon to come out of him, which it does, though not without one final act of defiance. The boy was convulsed by a seizure so powerful that those around him thought that he had been killed by the severity of it. But Jesus, who hasn't responded to this man's faith only to lose this boy to death, reaches down, takes him by the hand, and raises him to his feet. The text literally says that he resurrected this boy. We see here, beloved, a picture of the great reward that awaits those who place their trust in Jesus Christ. And that great reward is this. They receive their lives back. Those who've been, those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who cast themselves entirely on him and seek their salvation nowhere else but in him. They find that they have been rescued from death. They discover that they've been liberated from bondage to Satan. They discover that they have been lifted up out of the kingdom of darkness and that they've been drawn to stand in the kingdom of God. They discover that they've become blessed to have God as their father. And he is a good father. He is a loving father. He is a merciful father who seeks after the welfare of his children. So the challenge before us this morning, beloved, is to examine the boundaries of our own belief. This morning we have to ask ourselves, have I placed my trust in Jesus Christ the way this man did? Have I I unreservedly given my life over to him? Have I cast myself entirely upon his mercy? Or have I continued to harbor doubts about either his willingness or his ability to save me? And if that's the case, have those doubts, have they caused me to place a degree of my trust in someone or something other than him? What are the boundaries of my belief? Are there problems in my life that I believe are are too great or too complex or too long-standing for him to resolve? Are there situations where I wonder if he's really capable of effectively bringing change in my heart or my circumstances? And if so, have those doubts shaped the way in which I've appealed to him for aid. I think that's what James is alerting us to when he talks about being double-minded. If you ask the Lord for help, he says, but you don't really believe that he can or will respond to your need, then you can't be surprised when your prayers go unanswered. We've got to pray, says James, But we've got to do so without doubt or we'll find that we are like ships being tossed to and fro on the sea. And this this helps us to understand why the disciples have come up short when they had tried to cast out the demon. Later when they asked Jesus what had gone wrong, Jesus replies by saying that this kind can only be cast out by prayer. His point is, is that in all they'd done to try and help this boy, they hadn't turned to the Lord for strength. 
They hadn't thought to look to him. And instead, they'd chosen to rely on what they perceived to be their own strength and their own gifts in meeting the challenge that lay before them. In short, they'd taken their eyes off Jesus and the results had been disastrous. It's a powerful message for us at this time, brothers and sisters. We're facing some remarkable challenges as God's people right now. And in the midst of those circumstances, the boundaries of our belief are being tested. How prepared are we to cast ourselves entirely on him and to trust that not only is he in control of all things, but he'll make a way for us through the midst of all adversity? How eager are we to get down on our knees in prayer and to ask him to provide us with all that we stand in need of? And how confident are we that he's able to respond to the requests that we lay before him? Those are hard questions, brothers and sisters. They're questions that we can be afraid to really ask ourselves. But when we're afraid, to challenge our hearts with those difficult questions, then let us also remember that this passage doesn't just present us with a challenge, it also presents us with a radical comfort. Because we aren't just presented with the weakness of this father's cry, we're also presented with the power of the son's response. He didn't despise the father's plea on account of its weakness. No, he responded to it in might and in power. The son received his life back. The family's lineage was preserved in Israel. And since the father's cry is is representative of the cry of each and every believer, because it is so often true, That we believe, and yet we struggle with our unbelief. But because this Father's cry is representative of the cry of each and every believer, we can be confident that when we call to Him, no matter how pitiful our cries may be, He will respond to us with the same grace and love. Amen.